to our penultimate uh, 208. I have a variety of, of critters to start out today. The first is a uh, belted kingfisher, a bird that, as the name suggests, likes to uh, catch small fish uh, to eat. Uh, we have a, a bull snake uh, sensing the air with, uh, with its tongue there. Uh, not a not a venomous snake, fortunately. Uh, this is a common loon, but this one is only about a, a less than a year old, so uh, it does not yet look like uh, the adult uh, common loon, uh, which you will uh, you might hear on on uh, lakes in, in Minnesota. It has a very distinctive call. Christian, do you think the etymology of the word loony has to do with the loon? Uh, I haven't the faintest idea, but possibly. Who knows? Uh, one, one direction or the other, Elliot? I'm pretty sure Looney comes from like Looney. It's like someone who's like a possessor or a vector. I can see that. Uh, here's a great horned owl uh, staring, staring down the photographer. Uh, one of the most uh, common owls in, in North America. Uh, this is a Harris sparrow. It might uh, look pretty unremarkable, but uh, let me tell you, the presence of this bird uh, brought many pe uh, It was hanging around in my parents' backyard, and many people would come to their house because this bird isn't usually in Washington. And it was super exciting that there was a Harris sparrow, and it's just like a small brown bird. <laughs> so, uh, birders are, are an interesting species unto themselves. Uh, some non-birds, here's a whole crowd of painted turtles uh, gathering in the sun on a log. Uh, this is uh, one of the, the larger wood, woodpecker species, a pileated woodpecker with the, the red crest. Uh, and finally, a pair of trumpeter swans, uh, large, stately birds uh, that definitely don't want to get too close to. Swans will, will definitely bite you. Yeah, they, they will like protect, particularly if they're nesting, they'll start hissing at you when you get close, and you get close enough, they will charge at you and peck at you. So give them, give them some room. All right, uh, any questions about uh, the lab, about concurrency or parallelism to, to get us started? Louisa. Can I Yeah, so can I say a little bit more about the final? Uh, the final will be uh, a traditional kind of exam, something like 10 questions covering uh, material from the whole course. It will be online via Gradescope. So uh, you'll get uh, an invite to a Gradescope for the course uh, on Friday or maybe tomorrow. Um, but You'll log in with your Carlton email or create a Gradescope account with your Carlton email if you don't have one. And then you'll have the exam will go out by class on Friday and then it will be due 9 p.m. Uh, Wednesday the 24th, so the very end of exams. And take as much time uh, as you need. The Gradescope interface will let you it's a little weird, you submit your answers in order to save them, and then you can go back and change them or work on more questions by resubmitting. But you can basically submit any number of times. Unlike the quizzes, there's no uh, automatic feedback on all of them, just like a, uh, more of a, uh, a normal exam that way. Um, any questions on, uh, any other questions about the exam? All right, so at uh, the end of last time, started talking about parallelism and took a look at uh, this chart here at how computing hardware has evolved uh, and how the number of transistors on a CPU has continued uh, to increase exponentially, but only because we now have uh, multiple cores. 
And so uh, in order to have actual software continue to run faster and take advantage of the trends in hardware, the software needs to be parallel. It needs to be able to do multiple things at once uh, and divide up its work so that it can uh, take advantage of, of more than one core. And looked at some, uh, just a kind of comparison between the first ARM processor and uh, the new Apple M1 processor. A uh, couple interesting comparisons is that uh, the M1 has a 12 megabyte cache, and you, there's just like a spot on the chip where, where that cache is. Um, and uh, the, the ARM1 had, had a, a kind of 100 bytes of, of registers, took up a large portion of the, of, of the chip where 12 megabytes of, of cache uh, is a kind of similar area on, on the new hardware. So today I want to go through a kind of application of parallelism to actually take advantage of these multiple cores. Uh, this isn't going to be the most complex uh, of examples, but it does have, it is going to be a nice illustration of a number of things we have to think about when dealing with parallel code. So the basic situation is we have an array with uh, a little over 1 billion elements, 2 to the 30th. And we want to sum up the numbers in the array. So if we have one thread, we write a for loop, it goes through each element, sums them up. Uh, there's really not much better that we can do if we just have one thread doing this sum. But if we have be able to compute this sum faster if we split up the work between these multiple threads. That is, our thread 1 might sum index uh, 0 to um, uh, 250 million t2 some index 250 million to 500 million thread 3 to 500 to 750 and thread 4 750 to 1 billion. So we've basically taken our array divided it into four chunks and said, all right, thread one, you're responsible for the first chunk, thread two, thread three, and thread four. Chris? Um, the word one CPU, wouldn't it just switch between the threads adding, which is just the same as one thread doing it? Absolutely. Uh, if we only have one CPU, there's no reason to compute a sum this way because we can still only be have one of the threads adding things up at once. So let's say we're running on Mantis. Mantis has 30 CPUs. So there might be some advantage to be able to add each of these simultaneously. They each take, theoretically, one quarter the time that it takes to loop over the full array. And so now we've have four numbers to add at the end to get the total sum. Oh. Is it a problem if you have multiple cores if you use the word in the One CPU, you have those four cores, and then you still want to put, you know, in, in only one CPU, you can still also record faster, right? Yeah, that, that's, that's fair. We should be precise in our, our language. If there is one core, if we literally can only be executing one thread at a time, splitting up the work like this is only adding overhead for no benefit. Um, 
a given CPU, like the Man Mantis has a CPU, and that CPU has, I think, 15 cores, and each core can be running two threads, uh, is like what's actually going on. Uh, but we're just thinking this is on a system that can be uh, running, that has at least, can be running at least as many simultaneous threads as however many we'll create. John, do you have a question? <clears throat> so if, if it just in this specific case, like what's the advantage of having four like cores in a CPU and doing it this way instead of just having like one bigger and more powerful CPU? Like it, does that have to do with like writing to the register to disk or something like that? So one reason, uh, like what is the advantage of having like four different cores versus one bigger, more powerful core? Uh, one reason is that given a, a, a core circa 2005, we, can't, we do not have the technology to make a core that is four times better, four times faster. Like there's just, like the uh, power required and the heat generated by making such a core with our current technology would just not be feasible. So if we want to increase the computing power of our machines beyond uh, uh, making a single core faster, our solution is to include multiple cores. And now that we have multiple cores, the only way we can take advantage of them is uh, within a, making a single process faster. We can take advantage of them by having separate processes, each uh, running simultaneously rather than having to switch between them on a single core. But within a single process, within a single task of summing up an array, the only way we can make this faster using advances in hardware since 2005 is splitting up the work so we can do parts of it simultaneously in parallel. And so that's the motivation why instead of uh, one thread looping over all one billion elements, each thread's gonna loop over a quarter of that. And ideally, they're all doing this loop at the same time, and we compute the sum roughly four times as fast. Other questions? Yeah. Um, which thread would do the solve process? Or are they just like randomly pinpointed to the O or something? That's a good question. Like, uh, are, are you asking, like, each of these is computing part of the sum, like, which of them is putting it all together? Yeah, so there's some way that we're going to need to organize this. So let me, uh, let me lay that out. So, First step, we're going to have some global variables. Uh, we're going to have a global sum. Uh, data underscore t is, is uh, this is all coming from a nice uh, uh, program um, written by the, uh, the authors of, of the textbook that you can basically run to compute this parallel sum in a bunch of different ways in order to compare them. Uh, so I'll be showing parts of that code here and, and I'll, I'll link that code, the, the whole set of code from, uh, from the calendar. So I have this, a global variable that's going to be where we accumulate the sum. Uh, we'll have a global mutex for if we need to do some kind of, of locking. We'll have a, a global variable for the number of elements of our array that each thread is responsible for. So in this example, it would be 250 million. Uh, and then we'll have an array of our thread IDs, an array, and an array of ints that, will, that each thread will use to know which section of the array it should, it should take. So uh, the ID of thread uh, one might be zero so that it does zero to 250 and then thread two has an ID of one, and so it starts at one times 250 million, and it goes up to two times 250 million. Uh, so having these integer IDs is what our thread's going to use to know which section of the array. 
And we'll start by looking at a strategy where we uh, accumulate our sum in a global variable, in this global sum variable. So the code to set this up will look something like this. We'll figure out we have some number of threads. It's going to be between 1 and uh, some maximum. And the examples I'll, I'll show today between 1 and 16. And we'll use that to figure out how many elements in our array each thread is responsible for. We'll then use uh, pthread create to create each of our threads uh, to do part of the task. They'll execute some thread function, and I'll get into different different versions of that in the moment. In a moment, uh, and when we create a thread, uh, we give it a pointer to the thread ID, which is going which the create function will fill in with the ID of whatever thread it creates, uh, and we also give it a pointer to uh, this ID argument that it will use to figure out which section of the array it's summing up. After we create how many, however many threads, we're then going to wait for all of them to finish. So join on some thread ID says uh, this code will just wait until that thread is finished and then it will go around the loop again, wait for the next one. So we won't get to result equals global sum until all of our threads have finished. Elliot? So more specifically for the P thread thread, is that say like wait for thread zero to finish, and then after that we wait for thread one to finish. So we do go down even if like they kind of finish going back to front. Yes. Yeah, so this code will will join the threads. That is, wait for them to finish in the order that we created them. That is not necessarily the order that they will actually finish, but. That's okay because we can join a thread that's already finished and it will just return immediately. Like there's no, we don't need to wait for a thread that's already finished. This just ensures that we have waited, we have checked that all threads have finished before we get out of this, this for loop. Does that make sense? So then result is global sum. Uh, if the number of elements didn't divide evenly by the number of threads, we might have some sort of left over at the end that we'll add on in a kind of non-parallel step. Uh, but that should be that should be pretty small. And then we'll we'll print out print out the result. So what does our thread function look like? Uh, we have the function with no syn synchronization, which is named sum data race. Wonder what will happen there. Uh, and we get the ID from the argument passed in. We use that ID to say, okay, the index that we'll start at is that ID times the number of elements, and then the ending index is the start plus the number of elements that we should uh, we should sum up. We'll sum that up adding on to the global sum, and that's that's what each thread is doing. Each thread is figuring out, okay, which index in our array should I start at, and then summing up those into our global variable. Does that make sense? Questions on that process? Louisa. Why don't we have leftovers? Did you, did you say why do we have leftovers? Yeah. Um, so if our number of threads does not divide evenly into the number of elements, we want each thread to, to get the, the same number of elements based on kind of how we've written this thread function. So that might be something. We could design this differently to give the last thread all the rest, but that would actually make the code significantly more complicated, I think. All right, so how does this do? It does, I mean, we see some, some benefit. Uh, let me zoom out a bit here. So as the number of threads increases, uh, we do see our, our program run, run faster. Uh, when I uh, tested this on, on Mantis, it didn't plateau at eight, but it did see diminishing returns in, in how much faster it got. Uh, but the answer was wrong for any number of threads greater than one, because we have a data race on our global variable. So we, like we saw with the, the bad count program last time, we do a bunch of additions that get lost and overwritten. So that's not great. Uh, so what can we do? Well, we can add a mutex 
around our global variable, just like we saw last time. Our critical section is when multiple threads could be writing to the same location in memory, because that's when one might overwrite another through some interleaving. Etienne. Yes, so you are jumping all the way to the last thing we'll try, which is summing up in a local variable. So we're, we're getting there. But yes, that's a good idea. Uh, we, we, can, we can do a number of things to avoid writing to the same global variable every time around this loop. Uh, but for now, we're going to stick with that, and we're going to protect it with a mutex. So how does this do? Well, it totally sucks. Um, uh, the blue line here is our original code. I mean, it's wrong for things, uh, for threads more than one. Uh, but the mutex version, uh, quite slow. There's another kind of synchronization primitive, not a mutex, called a, a semaphore that I didn't talk about, has uh, certain other uses, um, but it's, it's even worse than the mutex. Um, so why is this, why is adding this mutex uh, make this, this sum so, I mean, it's correct, we get the correct sum, but why is it so much slower? Yeah, the, each thread is spending most of its time waiting for some other thread to unlock the mutex so it can add its, its section. So we've really just... Uh, made this global sum sequential, because we can actually be adding to our global variable in parallel, but also added the overhead of, with every addition, we lock on one mutex. So it's just, this is terrible. Uh, we don't want to have a single global variable and uh, force the, the addition to be concurrent. So what can we do that is better? So. The idea that we, the, the kind of first idea that we'll explore is what if we had uh, uh, a, we have our, our array that we're summing up, and now we're going to have uh, P sum, which is our an array of partial sums. This will also be global, a global variable. And it is, well, we had this problem where multiple threads were writing to the same location in memory, and so we had to use a mutex to protect those writes from interfering with each other. But instead, we'll have, if in this example we had four threads, uh, we will have our p sum array with four elements, and the first will be the sum will be where we will store the sum from t1, uh, our sum from t2, our sum from t3, and our sum from t4. So now each thread, uh, we still have a global variable, but now each thread has a separate location in memory where it is accumulating its result. So what do we need to, to make this work? We will need a couple new global variables. Uh, we're going to have psum, as I said, which have a, has a spot for each thread. And as we'll see, we're also going to have an idea of how much space is between each of these spots where we're accumulating a result. And by default, spacing one means they're right next to each other. So in this picture, our our partial sums are adjacent in memory. They're just right, right next to each other. Elements of memory. And so, how does this change? Uh, the code to, to make this all work. 
Uh, so it's quite similar. Uh, we've added a step to initialize each of our uh, partial sums to zero. And we're just assuming spacing is one right now, so it's not having any effect, but we'll, we'll see where, how that matters in a moment. And then once all our threads have finished, we have a little bit of work left to do. Uh, we have these four separate partial sums and we need to add them together. And we'll do that just in this, in this main thread, so that's not done in parallel. But we did, uh, like, the vast majority of summing up, we had a billion elements summed those in parallel to four, and then we just have, have three additions remaining. Does that make sense? Questions on that? All right, so in this approach where we have this uh, uh, array of partial sums. I'd like you to, to take a minute and discuss with your neighbors, will we need a mutex or some sort of uh, synchronization or can our threads proceed without any synchronization? Silas? We thought no because uh, we weren't going to be overriding some of the same stuff. It was going to be different outputs in, uh, in an array. So our, our threads going to be writing to different memory locations, so therefore we wouldn't need synchronization. Uh, Sam, uh, is that what you were thinking? Or? Yeah, uh, that, that, is, uh, that is correct, that we only need synchronization when we are writing to the same, uh, same locations in memory. Writes to two different locations in memory aren't going to overwrite each other. That's not a concern. So our Thread function doesn't need any uh, lock or, or unlock. Uh, it uses its ID and the spacing to figure out what index of this partial sum array it should use, and then it uh, computes the sum in there. So we're still computing in, in a global variable, but now uh, our threads aren't, aren't uh, fighting for lock or overriding each other and giving us the wrong sum. So we can look at how this, how this performs. And uh, it is uh, a significant improvement on uh, our uh, sequential, uh, sequential code, um, uh, rather it, uh, on our, on our uh, uh, code with, with our, our data race. But we also see that spacing out our elements of p sum, basically adding empty spots in our array between our partial sums, uh, results in a significant improvement in performance. So why is that? This gets to uh, the idea that uh, our processors, our CPUs, uh, when they are executing the instructions of our threads, uh, this will involve, and they're accessing things in memory, this will involve caching. When we access some element or partial sum, what, uh, is it just that element that gets loaded into a cache? No, what, what is it that, that we load into the cache? Yeah, things in, in memory around it, the whole cache block, however big that is. We take that little chunk and we put it into, into the cache. Uh, so that means that thread one, uh, uh, its partial sum could be in the same cache block as T2's partial sum. Maybe all four of these are in the same cache block together, which means CPU A, Uh, caches. So CPU A caches P sums. Let's say caches our whole array. And oops. 
CPUB also doing this in, in parallel, it caches this piece of array. And then CPU A say so adds to index zero. And CPU B adds to index one. And let's say at this point, is there a potential issue with the data that's, that's in our cache? Someone have an idea what that what that might be? Maybe someone I haven't heard from yet. Christian? Um let's see. I was gonna just ah, <laughs> you you faked me out. Yeah, yeah. Sent it. Uh, the CPU's A and the CPU's B's cache differs because um, the changes that B has made are not reflected in A and vice versa. Exactly. Our caches are, are out of sync. They're not consistent. Uh, this is, this is a, a, a problem we'd really like to avoid uh, because our system can't assume that the program that's running on, the thread that's running on CPU A uh, is only using one piece of the cache block. Because if it allows, if we allow these to get out of sync, then CPU A could compute something different using the same locations in memory that, that CPU B does. So we, we need to maintain cache coherence. This is just the, the term for keeping data that's, are, that's in different caches uh, all the same. And just to, uh, to remind you of the architecture going on here, uh, that our that our CPU A itself has its own L1 and L2 cache. As does CPU B. So each of our C, our, our cores has uh, those same caches. So our cache block gets loaded into those and can get out of sync. So the way that we can keep our caches coherent is by uh, not letting multiple threads write to the same cache block at a time. Which means that when a thread is going to write to a cache block, it needs exclusive access to that whole block. Or there's some process by which when one CPU makes a change, it notifies all the other CPUs that that change has been made, and the other CPUs have to get the updated version of that cache block before they uh, do any, uh, access it at all themselves. So there's a bunch of, of coordination or fighting between threads for access to our cache block. So the goal is to put our partial sums in separate cache blocks so that our, uh, uh, so that each CPU can uh, write to, to that partial sum without have, needing to coordinate with the, the, the other CPUs. And a simple way to do that is just to space them farther apart. Yeah, the same thing? Are cache blocks uh, the set size, or how do you determine sort of what's being placed in the cache? So each cache defines for that cache how big the blocks are. So L1 might be 64 bytes, L2 might be 256 bytes, L3 might be a kilobyte, something like that. 
Um, and so that's the, the purpose of this spacing is if instead of four, uh, a four element partial sum array where our partial sums are adjacent, we could space it out where T1 is in index zero, and then we have another eight bytes in between, and then T2, T3, uh, and T4, something like that. So this would be a spacing of, of two. Our partial sums are every two elements. Um, and so when we uh, put this spacing in, the spacing one, that's our, our adjacent uh, uh, partial sums, and we can put them every two elements, or every four elements, or every eight elements, or every 16 elements. And what we see is eight and 16 result in the same performance that is better than any of these, these other spacing, which suggests that if we have our partial sum every eight elements, in our array, and each of our array elements is eight bytes. That suggests that our cache block is 64 bytes. And if we put our partial sums in separate 64 byte blocks, now our CPUs aren't fighting with each other anymore. Um, and so that's, that, that, that's uh, good news. We can uh, get pretty efficient performance out of uh, this global partial sums array. And it also depended on empirically determining what the cache block size is in order to optimize our parallel code for the cache structure on the CPU. So a spacing of eight is just because the cache blocks in this test happen to be 64 bytes. And a different spacing on a different system might be, might be the optimal choice. Yeah. Um, so in the previous graph, we saw uh, um, this multi-thread stuff with the partial sums is faster than the data race. Like, I get why it is corrected this way, but why is it faster? Because don't you solve the same number of threads and do the same number of operations per second? So uh, in our kind of adjacent versus, uh, versus the data race, um, one reason we might see this is uh, in the data race we have a single global variable uh, and in our uh, adjacent uh, memory we still have them in, in separate variables so uh, there may be uh, less contention among our, our CPUs in the case where we have uh, multiple addresses in memory rather than uh, a single global variable um, but it's also the case that the data race and the adjacent are, are pretty similar. Uh, in my own testing on Mantis, um, no, not this one. There we go. Uh, in my own testing on, on Mantis, uh, I did not really see a difference between the adjacent and the data race. So this is something that uh, on whatever, whatever system um, these graphs were generated from, there was a difference between adjacent and, and race. Um, I did, was not able to reproduce that in my own, my own test. So I, there's not, uh, it would be some, clearly some, property of whatever system this was being, was being tested on uh, that's not shared by Mantis. Uh, other questions? So this uh, effect of when uh, we have separate data, but uh, it has this uh, cache coherence problem is called false sharing. Um, 
Uh, that's why this has false sharing effects. And uh, when we space it out enough so that uh, the threads are no longer interfering with each other in this way, call that true sharing. So now we're finally coming to Etienne's suggestion of why don't we just add up our sum in a local variable and then once we've added it all up in the local variable, then just do one single write to our partial sum array. If we're doing a local variable, where will that sum be stored as we're adding up? Uh, might be stored in, in memory, but there's actually a, another place that I think is more likely that it'll be stored. Etienne? Yes, if we have a local variable and it's something like an int that doesn't need an address, uh, we, don't, we don't have a pointer to it, we're almost certainly going to keep it in a register because that's the, the fastest, the, the lowest cost uh, uh, cycles-wise place that we can keep it. So. <coughs> Uh, where if we do our additions in a register and then just write once to our appropriately spaced uh, partial sum array, uh, that is the, the best performance out of all of these. So uh, lessons to, to take away from this uh, would be Why is it faster for still just one thread? Uh, because instead of always having to write the update to a global variable in memory, we're writing it to a register. Yeah, that, that's that's why it's it fast it's faster even when we're we're not multi-threaded. Uh, so one of the lessons sharing memory can be expensive. So both with this issue of cache coherence or with locking. When we're writing multi-threaded code, there are other issues than just kind of how we can split up the work that we might have to think about in terms of the threads that are sharing memory. Uh, if our threads were doing totally unrelated things and not using any of the same memory, we wouldn't have to really worry about any of these issues. These all arise from our threads need to coordinate using shared memory in some way. In this case, it was keeping track of uh, the sum. Uh, but there might be all sorts of things uh, that threads are coordinating about when some, when some job is done, uh, one thread is getting user input and making it available to, to others, things like that. Uh, and we talked about true sharing versus false sharing. I mean, think about uh, caching when we're when we're looking at performance. Uh, we want to if we can use a register uh, to to store some some intermediate results, uh, we definitely want to do that. Um, And similarly, kind of the next best thing than a register is uh, being able to access something something in a in a local cache. Uh, and uh, but that, that depends on uh, making sure our threads aren't, aren't fighting over with the cache. Uh, and to examine performance empirically. There were things that kind of came up in these uh, experiments with these different approaches that uh, were dependent on the properties of the underlying system, and so wouldn't necessarily have been apparent just from kind of 
looking at the code and, and analyzing it in a theoretical sense. Any questions on that? All right, so we do see in both this, this graph and, and others that there are, there are limits to parallelism. That uh, I bet at some point we stop getting benefit from, from adding more threads. Um, that would depend both on how many cores our system has, how much it can actually do in parallel, uh, but also on the algorithm or the task that, that we're using. So the sort of intuition is, is it faster if, if, uh, if you throw up a deck of cards and it drops on the floor? Is it faster to pick it up with one person uh, or two? It's pretty clear two people could do that job faster than one. Is it faster to do with 100 people instead of 50 people? Almost certainly not. Um, that if 50 people are trying to pick up 52 cards, adding another 50 uh, is almost certainly going to be that slower, not faster. So there is sort of a, uh, if we have a, a finite number of independent tasks, we have 52 cards on the ground, uh, there is a limit to how much we can parallelize that task. Like how much we can effectively split up the work. A, a single, like we can't, the, we can't split up the task of picking up a card. Uh, two people can't each pick up half a card. So that sort of puts a limit on how much we can parallelize, how much we can split up. 50 people with scissors, <laughs> the other 50 people pick up the cards. I mean, one person with some gasoline and a lighter deck of cards taken care of. <laughs> um, so no parallelism needed. Um, so some tasks might need to wait on others. So in, in our summing up an array or our picking up cards, these examples, none, no parts of this task need to wait on another. But if we have some uh, process that both wants to uh, sort some uh, list of data and then uh, search that list of data, so we want to sort a list and then say use binary search to, to search it, the binary search can't happen until after the sorting is done. So some parts of that task are sequential. We can do every part of it in parallel. <coughs> so that's kind of an, an intuition for how to think about, about parallelism. Uh, and there's a kind of specific theoretical uh, tool that gives us a kind of um, schematic way of, of thinking about how much benefit can we get from parallelism. This is called Andal's Law. And we have, we have three quantities, T, total sequential time. So if we just did our entire task without any parallelism, did just each step, if we summed up our whole array uh, in, in one thread in a loop, that's our time t, how long it would take. We have p the fraction between 0 and 1, the fraction of our total time that can be parallelized. So in the uh, parallel sum program, uh, the parts of creating the threads, waiting on the threads, printing out the final result, these are all parts that are not Parallels. We have to have a single main thread doing all those steps. So some fraction, in, in the case of summing up 
our array, that fraction is quite high because the vast majority of the work is actually summing up all those elements. But based on the task, some portion of it uh, can be parallelized. And K will be our speed up factor, which we can think of as the number of cores, like how many actual things can we do in parallel. And so using this kind of schematic description of a particular task, we can say that the time to perform our task when given k uh, number of cores is going to be the fraction of, um, uh, of our task that can, uh, that can be parallelized. So our fraction times our total time, that we can do faster by a factor of k. That we can split up among our k different cores. And then we have the remaining fraction of our time, 1 minus p, that we have to do sequentially, that isn't any faster from, from having multiple threads. So our Our kind of max performance would be when we have infinite cores, when we have infinite parallel resources. Uh, the parallel portion divided by infinity, that's going to be zero. It's going to be essentially infinite. So if we have infinite parallel resources, we're left with doing the sequential portion. So as a concrete example, let's say our total time is 10, our fraction of our program that can be parallelized is 90%, and our uh, number of available cores is nine. So with these, uh, uh, with this characterization of our, our task, our uh, time when we have nine would be our 0.9 times 10 uh, times our, our total time 10 divided by the number of, of cores that we have to split up that parallel portion plus the other 10% times our total time. And this will uh, give us uh, 9 divided by 9 is 1, 1 times 10 is 1, so that will be a uh, total time of 2. So with nine cores, we went from a total time of 10 to a total time of two. So we got five x speed up. We were able to do it five times faster when we had nine cores to work with. However, the depressing thing is when we consider what if we had infinite cores to work with, it's, this part goes to zero, as our denominator is infinity. We're left with the sequential part, so that's one. And so with infinite cores, if we had an impossibly powerful computer, best we can do <coughs> is go 10 times faster. And so this illustrates that there's actually an algorithmic limitation to the benefits we can get from parallelism. That depending on how much of our task we can uh, split up and have multiple threads work on different pieces, that 
it places a limit on how much faster we can do that task uh, uh, given given multi-threading. Right. Um, so this equation kind of like ignores the cost of set value, right? Like overhead, right? Like if could there not be a point where by adding another thread, it doesn't get significantly faster with the amount of time that it takes to like create the thread and put it over? So like you know, initialize the program it would be longer. You're slowing it down by adding another thread. Yes, that's that's uh, a good observation. That this is, I would say, a stylized model of multi-threaded computation. Uh, and as Elliot points out, it assumes a costless splitting up of work among our, our cores, which in practice is absolutely not true. Uh, so that's why this examined performance empirically is like one of our, our lessons. Um, and this, uh, this sort of stylized model is to help us think about the sort of algorithmic side of this, that uh, the choice of algorithm is going to determine kind of what fraction is parallelizable, which will determine how much we can improve performance with multi-threading. It's not going to be exactly what this equation gives us, but we would expect it to be proportional to it, kind of up to some point, as, as you say, at some point, further dividing our, our work. Uh, the overhead will, will outweigh the increase in performance. Other questions? All right. Uh, the last topic on parallelism that I wanted to touch on is parallelism at the level of assembly in, uh, of assembly instructions. So, if we have an instruction. Um, Let's say we have the instruction add Q percent RDI percent RSI and two registers together. So the CPU executing this instruction is actually not a single step. And we saw that with our uh, uh, bad count last time, that even when we had two different uh, threads doing the whole addition in one step, they, one could actually overwrite the other. Meaning that we know that this add instruction have, must have multiple steps inside it. Otherwise, it would be atomic and they, they couldn't overwrite it. So what are those actual steps? The first is, first is to fetch the instruction out of memory. All our instructions are at some, some memory address in the, in the code section of our address space, and so we need to fetch uh, uh, from memory. And so maybe it would be something like, this instruction is at address 400, 540, and in memory there are the bytes 4801FE, the three bytes that, uh, that make up that, that add Q, RDI, RSI. So we need to actually fetch these three bytes from memory at this address. The next step is to, the CPU actually needs to decode these bytes into the operation it should perform. Uh, so this isn't, Necessary. This, is, this doesn't mean taking these bytes and say turning them into the, the string add Q percent RDI, but it is taking those bytes and uh, the CPU's behavior, like where to send data, what registers to read from, that needs to be uh, somehow extracted from from the bytes of the instruction. So. It then needs to gather the data values, that's reading our two registers, read RDI, read RSI. It 
then needs to perform the calculation. And then store the result back into RSI. And each of these steps is going to be performed by a different part of our CPU. It's going to be some part of it that is fetching from memory, some part that's decoding bytes, some part that's reading data from registers, some part that's performing addition, some part that's writing to registers. And each of these parts can work independently. So, why does this matter? Let me illustrate it with an example of doing laundry. So, doing laundry has uh, multiple, uh, multiple steps involved in it. So, to do laundry, we need to put the laundry in the washer. We then need to put it in the dryer. We then need to uh, fold the laundry and then put it away. Uh, these four steps involved in doing a load of laundry, like when asking an instruction, we had five steps uh, involved in, in that. So if we do our laundry sequentially, uh, and we have uh, several loads of laundry to do, we do the whole like washer to dryer to folding to put away before we start the next load. And so the washer ends up being unused for some period of time in this example each of these steps takes 30 minutes so our washer just sits idle for an hour and a half before we start the next load but there's no reason that the washer needs to sit idle if we have four loads to put in the washer as soon as it finishes one load it could start washing the next one and so in this sequential example, our four loads take eight hours to do. <clears throat> if we pipeline our laundry, that means we start for each stage, we start the next step as soon as it's finished with the previous one. So at the same time we move the first load into the dryer, we put the second load into the washer. And as soon as we remove the first load from the dryer to start folding it, we put the second load into the dryer and put the third load into the washer. So that's. So the other thing, does it, if one of those steps is a lot faster, will it buffer and store up like a whole bunch of steps? Or in the case of a laundry example, if the washing machine is really fast, will it end up doing all the loads of laundry that possibly before even the second load of the dryer finishes? Or does it have, once it gets one step ahead, it'll like pause and be like, okay. So this is, this is a kind of interesting and complex issue. Uh, it's the case that, say, fetching something from memory, we know that it takes a lot longer than reading from a register. Uh, and so our CPU, uh, we really hate to have it sit idle doing nothing. Like That's just the worst possible thing that could happen from the, the computer architecture perspective. Uh, because it could be doing uh, billions of cycles per second, and now it's doing nothing. And that is devastating. Uh, so, CPUs do all sorts of just wild things to avoid this problem. So, uh, one thing that, that got in the news a few years ago because it turned out to be the source, uh, in some cases, of a, a security vulnerability is what's called speculative execution. So, the CPU is like, I don't have anything to do. So if I'm just going to start executing instructions I might need to execute in the future. And I might try like six different branches that I might need to do in the future when it actually turns out that I need to do one, I'll just use the result from that. Um, the vulnerability was on a like cloud uh, uh, computing for, that you rent from Google or Amazon or, or whatever. Uh, it turns out a like clever and motivated person uh, could execute uh, could execute a program that would cause the processor to do various speculative execution, and then could use how fast and in what way this happened to learn things about other execution going on on the system. Like, this isn't like perfect information, um, but. Uh, this was actually turned out 
uh, a serious vulnerability and Intel basically had to turn off some of these spec speculative execution features because even though they increased performance, uh, they sort of leaked information about what people were doing, uh, what, what instructions people were executing. Uh, so yeah, it might, it might go off, uh, execute other things. Um, it might, uh, uh, yeah, end up kind of buffering things somewhere. Um, uh, but in other cases, it might just have to stall and, and wait, and there's just no way to avoid that. Um, but uh, modern processors do pipeline their instructions in this fashion, so as soon as it's finished fetching one while it's decoding that one, it starts fetching the next one. Uh, uh, and there are a number of, situ uh, of contexts in uh, in computing where this kind of idea of pipelining comes up, where we have a multi-step process and we want to kind of overlay uh, our, our steps like this. Other questions on this? All right, that will do it for parallelism and class today. Uh, next time, we'll talk a little bit about Java versus C to put some things in context and uh, take a bit of a, a victory lap, uh, and then we'll be done. So I have office hours this afternoon, 4.30. Otherwise, I'll see you Friday.